picture of an ice cream cone beak. Uh, 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 uh. Oh, Is it a filming already? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Why? You've been making faces? <laughs> no. Our Conyer Q&A. You guys had a lot of questions about our son Conyers. Now we have three, even though it doesn't sound like it right this second. Uh, but we do have three, so I'm gonna go ahead and answer your questions. And if they're really noisy and annoying during it, you're just gonna get a better glimpse of what it's like to have a son Conyer because they are known for being really noisy. Actually, you'll realize how many three. Yeah, thanks. So, we're gonna get started. I started off with three, but two of them are on one of my play stands. So hopefully they decide to join us at some point. All right, so one of the first questions is, um, how do you build a strong bond, trust, and relationship with Conyers in situations um, where they haven't been treated the best? And I would say that building a bond and a relationship, whoa, hey, girly. Oh, girly. That's not the best spot. Baby girl. Good girl. Good job, Capri. No. Um, what was that? That was crazy. That was crazy. Uh, okay. So I go about building my bond with birds, whether they've had traumatic experiences or not, through trick training and usually through hands off trick training. So things that you can do without having to physically manipulate or have your hands very close to the bird. So something where you can drop a treat nearby, you don't have to hand it via your hand, and uh, things where you can use, oh, you're so cute, the distance to train. Cute. You're just adorable. <laughs> okay, let's get no. back to the video. Okay. Is there any special training that went into free flight training since they're not one of the common species to free fly? Uh, yeah, well, yes and no. So since they're so brightly colored, we have an easier time spotting them. Also, since there's three of them and they usually stick together, they're a little bit easier to spot. And because they're so noisy, it's really easy to know where they are when they're free flying, which is why even though they're smaller, they're one of the more common species that you do see free flight trained because of the noisiness and the brightness and the colors. Now with that said, we did free flight train them a little bit differently and that's, I'm not really sure why that happened. I think it just was due to our lifestyle at the time and the different circumstances that we were going through. Beef girls, let's go. Come on, come on, hurry up. <laughs> okay, cause you guys are being noisy over there. You're just being noisy over there. Are you coming? Can I have her? Yeah. Thanks. Um, so one of the things that happened when we were free flight training them is we handled it all pretty similar to how we normally free flight train our other birds. But a lot of the time we were in Monticello, Utah and kind of training on our property. And we were just really mindful and careful because it wasn't the most ideal spot to be free flight training. And we were running into a lot of issues of housing these guys where we normally house all of our other birds due to their noisiness. It was disrupting a lot of people based on where we were traveling through and where we were. So we were finding we couldn't have them outside as much, which is a big problem when you're trying to desensitize to the outdoors. Oh, hey, girly. Now we have all three of them. We have all three. It's probably gonna be short-lived. Maybe. <laughs> Here we go. So the free flight training, oh, and she's gone. Uh, really does work the same with the smaller birds, but we're just a little bit even more picky and mindful about where and when we fly these guys. Um, with that said though, sometimes they can come out at locations where we might be a little bit more uncomfortable with our large birds. So for instance, free flying in our front yard, we're most comfortable with probably our Galabondi and then our three sun conures. Are you taking a hair bath? Are you taking a hair bath? Mom, 
Why? What are we doing? <laughs> oh boy. Why are you in the baby swing? <laughs> because put a bobby. You call him. Baby. Baby. <laughs> well, then I got this. Pardon? She's like, how do I land on that moving <laughs> object? <laughs> I feel like this girl's the only one being good. <laughs> <laughs> Capri, what's your favorite thing about owning Sun Conyers? Um, they're cute. <laughs> um, I really like their colors. Yeah, that is probably the nicest thing about yeah. having a Sun Conyer is the way that they look. <laughs> Not so much the way they sound. Just how loud are they? They're really loud, guys. Right now, they're being very good, which I feel like every time I do a video, it's really not that bad. But, for instance, when I first walk into saying hello to them, they will just scream. They're more and most likely to just be screaming and making noise just for fun. It seems to be self-reinforcing. They're also the ones that will lose their minds over seeing something outside. So, I would say they're crazy loud. Um, we have more complaints over the years of having birds about these guys than we do of our macaws. And some people just hate the type of screech that they do. You know, a macaw can get incredibly loud, but they aren't usually doing it for the consistency and amount of time that these guys are. So even now, just sitting here trying to have this conversation, they go off intermittently so especially with three of them when one loses their mind all three of them lose their mind so it's tripled when you have more than one so just so you guys have an idea they're sitting in the window yelling about things which we don't know what they're yelling about <laughs> commenting about things yelling about things narrating about things expressing themselves I draw to them one of them screaming so as far as how I house my Sun Conyers, at the moment I don't have as much space as I would like to when it's cold outside. So when it's cold outside and I have to house all my birds indoors, the three sisters are usually together. Once I can start moving the larger birds outside, the larger birds are the first to move outside, then I can separate my three Sun Conyers. Also when we travel, I do keep them separated. So as much as I can, I try to keep them separated. Otherwise, for some reason, these three girls Girls tend to over preen each other on the top of the head especially the other two do it to Lily and it just doesn't look pretty so I do prefer to keep them separate but they are really great about being together um, and I think that's because I can offer them some separation time but for the most part they do find themselves together uh, even when free flying I do try to divide my time and take one or two out and not always all three I try to just really divide it <laughs> Especially the babies. <laughs> Girl! Talk to you. <laughs> keep going, keep going. 
Ideally though, if I had the space, I would have all three separated. Right now I don't know how I would do that um, and give everybody adequate space that I would like to. So hopefully someday. Dad, all three. Cute. <laughs> oh, so this is an interesting question and it's about um, what are some of the concerns we should have about big birds interacting with small birds? So these people specifically have a sun conure and they're thinking about getting a larger bird in the future. The thing about sun conures is they are big bird personalities in little bird bodies. So they really think that they are bigger than they are and when they get angry, they get super puffed up and try to make themselves as big as possible. They do some grumbling, you know, they try to look as intimidating as possible. So the problem that I've run into with sun conures is that they won't necessarily always back down. Um, they kind of tend to pick fights with the bigger birds and pick on them and kind of bully them. And it can get them in trouble because they are a lot smaller and they can get hurt a lot easier. So a sun conure bite to a macaw may not be as devastating as a macaw bite to a sun conure. Now that's going to cause some serious damage. So it's really important to be incredibly mindful of that and mindful of how bullying you allow your birds to get with one another. You don't want it to be something that builds up and goes on and on and on where one bird is just looking or waiting for the opportunity to get them. Uh, so it's something that we have to be incredibly mindful about, especially when free flying because we're out there to enjoy it. The last thing we want is for the sun conures or any of our birds for that matter to get hurt from one another. So. Definitely something to be aware of. I got the sun con, you're eating a hot dog. <laughs> can sun conures eat hot dogs? No. No. <laughs> so a lot of you have been wondering, because Comet, my Camelot macaw, looks like a sun conure, looks like a giant sun conure, uh, if they have any sort of method of treating him differently. They treat him like the Sun Conure King and all of that. They pick on, Con on Comet the most out of all of my macaws. And I think it's because Comet makes the least amount of effort to defend himself or do anything about it. He just kind of takes it. He's a very nice guy. Uh, so they take advantage of him in that way. But no, I don't think they think he's a Sun Conure King. I think, I think they just like an easy target. I'm the worst person to ask on what a good price is for a bird. I have not actually bought a bird in nine years, uh, which is how old these girls currently are at the filming of this video. And although maybe they're 10 now. So these girls were, I think, $350 each, if I remember correctly. A lot? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you think you made a bad decision spending that much money on sun conures? They're loud, but they're really cute and just a little bit cuddly. <laughs> <laughs> but I really like buying them. Yeah, it's pretty accurate. What's this? A sun conure eating ice cream. <laughs> Can sun conures eat ice cream? Oh, <laughs> uh, let's see. Jelly are like, give me ice cream. <laughs> So when free flying your conures, do you mind the weather and how much wind is outside? Yes. Uh, one of the days that we had a great day at the dunes, it started to really pick up and get too windy. And the sun conures, when it gets incredibly windy, they quit. And they quit by either burrowing into somewhere in like the back of your neck, under your hair, in a safe place in your clothes, or they'll literally put themselves away into a travel carrier if we brought along one, or they'll just simply fly back to the truck. And even if they can get inside the trailer, they'll wait inside the trailer. Um, when we were flying, at the Mesquite sand dunes, there was kind of a bush nearby. It was a large tree-ish bush, um, but not super tall. And they all knew that we were heading back and they beelined it for that and just waited in the little branches in there so they weren't getting blown around because trying to carry them down the dunes and have them just hang on was not working out for them. So yeah, they can only handle so much wind before they just start getting shoved around and it's no longer fun. What would you like to show? Uh, can you eat pizza? Can they eat pizza? <laughs> How did you train three birds at once? My three green cheeks will not train together. This is kind of something that you have to play by situation and scenario. 
for us, Lily gives us the best training response. She's the one that's most, um, that will initiate wanting to work for everything and wanting to learn. And if we just focus on her, the other two tend to use observational learning where they watch what Lily does to earn a treat and they will start participating that way. So it's, um, it's something where if you have more than one bird and you're trying to train them, but you're struggling in that scenario, just focus on one and the others will follow suit and it won't be as much pressure on you. Uh, how can I tell them apart? So this is an interesting one, it's very subtle and it's mostly by my Conyers behavior more than how they look. They all look very similar. Lily is kind of the, the one that is likely to start everything first. She's the one that will be the most eager to come out of the aviary, be the one that's free flying the best, be the one that's taking initiative on everything. Um, she's also the most yellow out of the three sun conures of mine. She is just vibrantly yellow all through her back. And then Dietka is the baby. She is literally the, the youngest of the three. And she is usually the one that will follow suit with Lily. So, so she'll usually, whichever bird initiates doing something first, Dietka will be soon to follow. And she's kind of our runner up in a sense. She tends to copy Lily to a certain extent. She has a little less interest in training, but she's still there. And she's probably bonded most to Dave out of the three of us, um, and sometimes Capri. And whereas Lily's very bonded to me. And then Phoebe is our middle child, and she's the one that personality wise, she's just less willing to participate. She doesn't really want to. She'll be the one that will hang back in the aviary. She'll stop free flying earlier than the other two. Uh, she'll be the most likely to just find a person that will tolerate her burrowing into your neck and playing with your hair. She loves to preen hair and just kind of be on you and hanging out. She's not as interested in flying or training. Um, she's probably our most cautious. She's the one that will alarm call to everybody else. Uh, she is the one that, yeah, she's just our, our very cautious girl. Now Dietka has a little bit more orange and red on her back and Phoebe's just kind of the one that looks like a normal typical sun conure. So unless you see the, the extra red orange, then you know it's Dietka. If you see the bright, bright yellow, then you know it's Lily. And if you don't say, I, see either of that, then you know it's Phoebe.